Hello, part two of the White Wolf program, and we're going to uh, analyze today the second week of its cycle. And by the way, this video marks the uh, start of what I would call my average uh, frequency for publications. I'm going to get back to publishing every day. This week was a little break. So, if you want to watch part one, it's in the program reviews. Uh, this is the second part of that. We've already reviewed a full week. And I will, as usual, with what Whiteboard asked me to do, I will pay close attention to the frequency and the ability to recover day to day. And I will focus on that when I wrap up this video. But for now, let's talk about the rest of his upper lower split. So for week two on Monday, he starts with inclined barbell bench, 4 by 8 to 11. Good rep range. You can also try it a 6 to 10 reps on this if you want to stick to 4 sets. Incline barbell bench is a lift that I personally don't really like. I think it's, it's a mix of vertical and horizontal press that is closer to a... It's, cl it's much closer to an horizontal press than most people realize because of the degree of inclination of most incline bench. And you're not going to recruit the uh, side and rear delts as much as you think you do. Meaning what? Meaning that you're going to over recruit the front of the delt that always gets recruited in every single press regardless. It can be a dangerous lift for many people. Uh, this lift has a higher injury rate than the normal flat barbell bench press, I would say. So if it's something that you find has carry over to your strict overhead press or a flat bench, that's great, keep doing that if you can do it without pain. And I've also found that some people have the structural ability to recruit a lot of upper chest on inclined barbell bench. Telling people to do it for the upper chest is most of the time a bad advice because it doesn't recruit that portion. For some people, for, for others it will. But the type of people that get upper chest activation from that usually also get it from overhead press. So it's a double whammy in a sense. And you superset that with lat pull downs. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to approach that as in this inclined barbell bench. You do not consider strength work, and the rep range sort of reflects that, which is why you're supersetting it, and that's fine. I do it too. If I have a lift that is in specificity related to another compound and it's supposed to help grow that compound and give me tonnage, I will also superset it because it's not strength work. I told you what I thought about the lat pull down. I always like uh, chin ups better or pull ups better, but if you have the ability to do it on a good machine where the bar is right above your, above your head and not in front of you, then keep doing it. Four sets of 10 to 12, that's an excellent prep range. For cable stuff, I also tell people you can go higher just because the mechanical breakdown aspect of the lift is not as important, it's much easier to prevent and therefore you can push the reps and still stay within a rep range that is going to uh, promote muscular fatigue and not necessarily uh, mechanical fatigue. After that, dumbbell flat bench press, three sets of uh, 11 to 14, that's a strange rep range but it's okay, it's higher, and apparently you're doing a lot of higher rep ranges on that day for the presses. And you superset that with barbell seal rows, which is an excellent lift. Probably one of the best type of rows, actually, if you have the type of equipment where you can do that, because it takes the posterior chain out of the equation, it allows you to pull with what is basically a perfectly horizontal back, and you're going to be able to recruit a lot of muscles that you don't really recruit when you do rows, because your torso angle is uh, too vertical and use too much leg drive. Okay, so that's a good superset as well. Presses and row and uh, rows and pulls, especially if it's horizontal and uh, horizontal in both cases. So an horizontal press and an horizontal pull, or a vertical press and a vertical pull, do complement themselves perfectly, in my opinion. After that, you do dumbbell hammer curls, two sets of 12 to 15. I think two sets is a little bit low uh, for that type of curls. I would always advise you to do more sets and lower the reps. And you superset that with cable tricep pushdowns, two sets of 13 to 16, so you basically do high reps. That's perfectly fine on that type of stuff. 
and I suppose that then it's another superset, so it's technically a giant set, where you're going to do side raises two sets of ten of thirteen to sixteen. So I see the logic in that because if you stick within two uh, sets, you're going to be able to do gi two giant sets in a row. It's going to get it's going to tax the cardiovascular system a little bit, and it's going to give you a massive pump. This is of course not the best case, uh, not the best scenario for progression, but for straight up tonnage, it's still quality volume. So that's all good. If it, if it's what you're gunning for, if you want progress, of course you would uh, you would most likely not do that within a giant set. Tuesday you rest. Wednesday you do legs, so it's a lower day. SSB squat, excellent lift. And you say it's a free squat, so you don't have a box, you just go as low as you can, great. Uh, the SSB is, in my opinion, a piece of equipment that every gym should have. And if you have a home gym, you should get one, because it's a game changer on many, many things. After that, you do all DLs, two sets of 12. Then you follow that by glute arm raises, two sets of 12 to 15. So you basically are going to split your hip hinges between two different types of exercises that might not target the same area of the hammies instead of just doing four sets of RDLs. That's valid. It's a perfectly good uh, way to approach posterior chain development. An SSB squat is going to be, and a lot of people don't understand that, I see a lot of people say it's like a front squat. It's not like a front squat. The, the, the weight doesn't sit uh, in front of you as much as in a front squat and the way the bar sits on you is going to force a lot of that weight in a position that it's going to fold your torso forward but it's not the, it's the difference be, between being pushed in the chest right by someone in front of you or pushed in your back a front squat is someone who's basically i shouldn't say pushed in the chest pulled a front squat feels like someone is tugging on your shirt from the front because it's the thoracic extension that's like being pulled forward. An SSB is more of the middle back. It's, it feels like someone is pushing on your middle back to try and bend and fold you in half. It's a different sensation and both lifts are valid, but they cannot replace one another. Just saying. And I say that because the SSB recruits a ton of posterior chain. So it's going to be, it's perfectly good because your strength fork is going to warm it up and then you're going to be able to go ham. Then you do sled pushes. Sled pushes also recruit a ton of posterior chain, but it's going to be a finisher, right? It's like endurance training, so that's fine. And pulls. Pulls are different. I don't know how you do your pulls. Some people do them explosively like a face pull, so that's upper back training, which in your case, I would say would be a great uh, variation. Or if you do a cornerback uh, back sprint where you back pedal with it, which also recruits a lot of legs. And then you do your Thursday. On that day, I have nothing to say. This looks like an excellent day. It looks minimalistic in a sense, but I know that within your training, you don't train lower body as much. So that's perfectly fine. On Thursday, you do football bar bench press, four sets of eight to 10. So you told me about the football bar. You like to alternate between the things. Football bar is going to put the accent on the triceps. And you superset that with cable low row with a neutral close grip, okay? I like uh, rows with a cable. I think it's probably the best sort of a cable you can potentially have. From what I get, and I'm just going to say that for this week, I see a lot more supersets. I see a lot less strength work. It's not bad. It's good because the two weeks are going to repeat themselves so much that you're not going to miss anything. If I saw that type of cycle or block with a three weeks period for someone who trains for hypertrophy, I would tell you this is not a good approach because you need to have both volume and strength work co co cohabiting within the same program with a frequency that gives you enough of both. In this case, it's, it's good. <clears throat> so after that, uh, you are going to do no, never mind. The, the football bar bench press was superset with a neutral grip pull-up, which is synergistic. That, that's the very definition of synergistic. You're going to press with that grip. You're going to pull with that grip. That's extremely intelligent. You don't really see that very often in programs. 
So the neutral grip pull-ups for sets of 8 to 10. And you told me also that they're all weighted, so it's all good. Uh, you better have a rep range ready for when you do weighted pull-ups. You can go arm wrap when you do body weight, but if it's weighted, you need to be able to track progression. After that, with Viking presses, a neutral grip, so it's a neutral grip heavy day. Three sets of 9 to 12, excellent. The Viking press, I find, I find that people tend to want to do low reps with it, and they end up struggling to get into position. And the first rep really is the toughest one, which is not something you want to do because it has a high risk of injury. So you want to be able to rep it so that the exertion of the first rep is going to match the exertion of the last reps per se. It's not normal that your first rep is slower than the other reps. It shows that the exercise and the setup and the, the coiling mechanisms in your body to get that going require you to put you in a position that you're not strong in, if that makes sense. And you superset that with T-bar row, neutral grip, three sets of eight to 12, same logic here, excellent preference for the T-bar row. I see too many people deadlifting their T-bar rows. You can use some leg drive, but don't use only the leg drive. If your arms are like this and the elbow flexion that you get is this, you're not training your back unless you want to do a weighted stretch. And in that case, you don't even have to go with the elbow flexion. Cable flies after that. So cable flies, you're going to recruit more chest that the football bar bench press might not have given you. So that's great. 12 to 16 rep range is perfect. Same for cable flies. Cable flies recruit a lot of uh, arms and shoulders in a sense that they support the chest and they help it extend and contract. But these are the portion that can get injured. You can hurt your shoulder trying to get in position to, for that cable fly. So you want to keep the weight low. And you superset that with cable rear fly. So more shoulder work, excellent. You can never do enough rear delt works. Your rear delt, I found, you will never injure the structure. You will always burn out uh, in a muscular fashion before. And your rear delts, when you start working them because they're so small, they burn out like this. And when they're sore and tired, they're just useless for days and days. So it's great because you need to be able to give them that uh, endurance if you want them to grow. And then you do dumbbell curls, two sets of 12 to 16. So I suppose that the cable flies, the rear flies, and the curls are a giant set. Same logic, you do only two sets for a lot of reps. Perfect, I'm not going to touch that. I understand why you do that. Friday, you rest. Saturday, you do a dumbbell incline bench. So it, we, uh, so this time it's an incline bench with dumbbells, which I actually like better than with a straight barbell because it allows you to manipulate the uh, angle of the elbows more and to tuck it, uh, tuck in more and to not burn out the shoulders as much. And you superset that with cable low rows. So that's where it was coming from. Uh, this time it's a, it, see that it's funny here because you're doing a, a hybrid of a vertical and horizontal pull with a cable low row, which is technically an horizontal pull, right? Even if it's not on the same plane as a normal row or a seal row. The rep ranges are high between eight to 12 and 10 to 12. Uh, that's in the description if you want to know the exact details. Very good. Uh, it's again, it's, in the, it's inscribed within the logic of the week, a lot of volume. After that, you do seal rows again, three sets of 12 to 15. 12 to 15 might start being a little high, uh, you might want to lower that to keep the intensity relevant. T-bar, high angle, real delt row. I think I know what you're talking about here. I, uh, it's a good lift. And then you do straight arm lat cable pullover. And then you do tricep cable extensions, the two of them for the two sets with the same logic that you've applied before. So I see a lot of focus on isolating the portions of the upper back. Uh, this to me is great because you're using methods of isolating the upper back that are going to add a ton of volume and tonnage over time. And the upper back is the most underdeveloped body part in natural bodybuilders. It is insane how little most people train it. It can take a massive punishment. As long as you get the body part used to the punishment, it can take just insane amounts of volume and tonnage. And then it's going to grow and respond to it. So I see that in your program and that's a very good focus. I do see, however, that you don't really focus on the traps. Um, I don't know why, but if you do want to focus on the traps more, just add shrugs with uh, multiple torso angles. You rest on Sunday. 
And that's that. I covered everything. So you also tell me that you, after the workouts, the upper body one, you do uh, rear flies and face pulls for the shoulders. You can never do enough of them. Excellent. Uh, you, after the lower body workout, you do the calf raises. You do crunches, you do oblique crunches, planks, leg raises. So that's excellent. That's how you get a strong core by working it all the time. Do not apply a body part split principle to your core. Your core needs to be worked every single day through isolation, through contraction, through stretching, isometrics, all of that. Train your core all the time. It's what is keeping you healthy. It's what is keeping you rigid when you lift heavy. And you need a good looking core if you want to look aesthetic. It is primordial. And as he says, he wants to design the program to be healthy on the shoulders, which I think it is. Great work on that. And on the knees, which it is. The knee flexion and the amount of horizontal uh, presses is very well controlled. Now, let's talk about your frequency and uh, the recovery aspect. So for your week one, as far as the posterior chain, I have seen a lot of it. But you don't really do super taxing pulls from the floor. So the, there should be no issue with recovery there. Your lower back should be safe. And also because the knee flexions you do tend to be uh, on the easier side. Meaning by that, that you clearly don't really have a focus on developing your quads. And that's all good. So your knees and your lower back are going to be safe. The shoulders, you do neutral grip all the time. Um, I would say be careful with the incline presses. If you have nagging shoulder pain, you might check that, check that and maybe you replace it with more overhead press or stick to dumbbells for the incline. But uh, for both weeks, uh, I see something that makes perfect sense in my opinion. Now let's talk muscles. Is your recovery maxed out and is your frequency proper for hypertrophy? I like the way you approach upper-lower training because you don't let the upper-lower template restrict yourself. In a sense, you are still doing a classical upper-lower because you're not mixing it up. I see so many people who say they're doing an upper-lower. In reality, what they're doing is a body part split, which is, in my opinion, the best type of programs, right? But from what I see here, I do say that you can potentially, and that's up to you, of course, but you could add on your lower day, because your lower days are short, quote unquote, you could add more upper, uh, upper back work. So let's say you wanted the shrugs to go somewhere. I would actually add them with the way your program is uh, set up on your lower body days. But as far as program goes, I reviewed a lot of them now on this channel. This is one of the best ones. This is one that I clearly can tell you put some thought into it. The rep ranges go well with each other. And the, I'm going to finish on that. The one thing I would say is you could, you could actually lower most of your rep ranges by 20% tw uh, of the rep ranges and the, the number of reps, which would uh, bump your intensity up a little bit more. And that's across the board. Um, because from what I see, I don't know if you've realized it, but your week one is much more intensity focused than the week two. And it's not by a lot and it's on only portions of the training, but the portions of the training that they represent tend to be what we would classify as strength work. So you have a strength uh, work week, which is an intensity week and a volume week. But because they're so close to, uh, in tonnage to, to each other, they don't really represent a true intensity and volume week, which in my opinion is a terrible way to program, by the way, it's not good. You need both values to exist within the program every single week at all times, which is why to go back to what I said, I like the way you approached it here, because there is a slight variation between the week, which is going to keep it fresh, entertaining for you, because it is going to be a slight difference in stimulus for the body. But because it repeats itself in an infinite cycle of week one, week two, week one, week two, it's perfectly fine because the frequency is enough. It's two weeks of one and two weeks of the other a month. So White Wolf, uh, congratulations for that program. It is great. If someone wants to run an upper, upper lower and they have the same prerequisites as White Wolf, I would highly recommend that program uh, because I do think that it is going to produce good hypertrophy results. 
And as far as covering up the entire body, as I said, it is a pretty com complete program. There is a lack of forearm isolation, but there's so much pull that you don't really need it. You might add some wrist curls if you want to uh, actually get some uh, wrist flexions in there. I would add more long end of the tricep work. Uh, the bicep work could be done with more intensity. As I said, the traps are not really getting targeted, but the rest is covered. So thank you for watching. Any question you might have, let me know at White Wolf. I will pin you again for this time. Have a good day.